labadiena visiems, iš pradžių poras sakinių nesabu kalba, tęsime nuotolinių paskaitų ciklą kaip žmogus suvokė architektūrinę aplinką, kurią kartu su partneriu žurnalų statybų ir architektūrą į portalų esa.lt ir iš dalies finansuoja Lietuvos kultūros taryba šitą ciklą, o šiandieną paskaita anglų kalba, todėl aš toliau tęsiu angliškai, so I'm switching to English. Uh, and uh, let me present today's lecture. Uh, Dr. Christian Rolf is a researcher, artist, designer, building participatory technologies uh, for collective representation. I uh, may say uh, innovator and uh, social communicator in a way. And uh, he has invented and built the biomapping device and tested it in uh, several uh, mega innovative large-scale public art projects uh, such as uh, biomapping and emotion mapping and thousands of participants uh, across 16 countries took uh, part in this project and uh, uh, besides uh, christian has written uh, numerous uh, books and magazine articles including uh, the book Emotional Cartography, Technologies of the Self. Uh, also, um, he uh, given numerous uh, lectures and key speeches across the world uh, as an artist and uh, researcher. Uh, he took part uh, in various uh, exhibitions, group exhibitions uh, across Europe, uh, starting with, uh, of course, uh, United Kingdom, but also in Finland, uh, Switzerland, France, etc., and uh, also in uh, the United States. And uh, recently, uh, Christian is uh, a research fellow in the Social Design Institute uh, at the uh, University of uh, Arts in London, and today Christiana will uh, present his lecture, Emotional Cartography, uh, raising questions, how does the city make feelings? And also how we can use these feelings in shaping our cities. So uh, Christian, the floor is yours. You may share the screen and, of course, add the few words if I skipped something very important. Well, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation. I really appreciate it. I'm really happy to be here and talking to a group of artists and urban designers, as far as I know. So I think that's a really exciting context to talk to. Um, as Ida sort of really gratefully, um, really super introduced me, uh, I'm an artist and I think it's interesting to talk across disciplines. Um, about 10 years ago, I went back to do my PhD. It was in science and technology studies. So I'm a fairly recent academic in that sense. So I'm, I'm gonna be talking maybe as an artist, but also as a sort of an academic, trying to make sense of my previous work a little bit. But I'm really happy to be here talking to this kind of interdisciplinary crowd. Um, as far as I understand, we've got quite a lot of time today, so I want to kind of make sure we have at least half an hour of discussion at the end, if that works for everybody. Um, I think I'm not going to make a break in the moment, but I, I think it should be fairly easy. It'll be a lot of pictures, so, you know, but if you have any particular questions that you sort of burning questions, feel free to, you know, add them in the chat or even unmute yourself and we can just make it slightly more participatory if that works for everybody. So if there's any particular clarifying questions you need to ask that you can't wait until the end, you can ask me um, through the talk. Um, so super, yes, let me try and share my screen. One moment. There you go. I hope that's full screen. Yes. So, yes, super, super. So, <clears throat> So how do places make us feel and how should we use feelings to make places? So um, I've been, I'm going to use throughout the presentation these little bits in red, which are me adding emphasis onto things. And I guess the emphasis I want to make here is the, the should in the sense that I'm, 
and proposing that there might be a normative dimension. There's a sort of an agenda I'm presenting. So there's nothing, it's not particularly neutral. I'm trying to suggest at the end of this talk that there might be a normative framework for how we might want to use feelings or how we might want to think about the ethics of using feelings to make places. So in the talk, I'm gonna talk a little bit about a historical context very broadly. Um, then I'm gonna talk uh, well, I'm going to talk about the 1950s and 60s, where a lot of this, the ideas for this kind of work originated um, with kind of Kevin Lynch. Um, and then I'm going to talk about contemporary practices, including my own, and add some of the observations that I've kind of developed over a decade of doing this kind of work, and then this normative framework that I talked about. So, um, I'm going to be working through this paper that I wrote fairly recently, um, How Can We Use Emotions to Articulate Cities? So if you're interested in reading a little bit more deeper, there's a little bit more detail on that. So yeah, find that paper, it's online for free and open access. And just to tell you where I'm coming from in terms of a kind of theoretical framework, um, Bruno Latour, you know, very famous philosopher, but he wrote this very interesting paper called How to Talk About the Body which I can heavily recommend people, where he really talks about um, a different way of thinking about the body, which is not the dualist body that's kind of separated between, you know, the material body and the mind, but how we really use some of the philosophical ideas of uh, the connectedness um, to basically articulate the world around us. So he talks about an articulate subject as someone who learns to be affected by others, and that, that kind of little statement is something that I'm going to get back to in the sort of normative um, idea on how to, how to think about, you know, feelings and bodies. Um, so just to kind of start with some very early illustrations of what an emotional cartography might be. This is some kind of early kind of cave carvings um, that are, you know, we don't really know what they are, but they show activity, human activity, and what I think is amazing about them is we can see narrative stories that tell, of, tell us much more than kind of practical information about the world. They tell us about lives lived and the relationships between people and the environment. And, you know, we see this through many, many representations over time. This is quite an, um, one I really like very much. It's kind of, it's called a song of England or um, and it was a, a strange kind of 16th, 17th, 16th or 17th century um, map of the whole of uh, the UK, which kind of represents all the um, towns and rivers as these kind of anthropomorphic representations where you have, um, for example, you know, the rivers becoming these kind of nymphs and you see people's working in the um, cutting cutting down corn there's a sort of a sense of a lived experience which is more than just you know place so there's a very long history of trying to represent lived life in maps and i'm going to talk specifically about maps and mapping today so there's lots of different ways in which we might think of representing um, emotional experiences but I'm, I'm really going to focus on the idea of maps and what maps might do within that so just to show you another sort of historical map of this, this is a, a map of tenderness, which is from a sort of French poet, a sort of romantic poet. And you see apparently at the bottom there, um, almost the start of a relationship with different steps going up with these kind of towns leading at the top to conception with a sort of fallopian tube type of structure. So this is a sort of, it's an emotional cartography in the most obvious kind of sense, you know, the lake of indifference, um, where it's literally the relationship projected onto uh, a geographical map that is no longer geographical, but has some kind of, some of the, some of the language of geography combined with it. So this is a very old idea, but I guess I want to contrast it with some sort of maybe harder um, representations. This is a, a booth map, which is a descriptive map of London poverty, um, 1889. And what's fascinating about this, this really involved um, researchers walking across uh, the whole of London with policemen to actually identify what was going on in each road and each house 
and they were color coding um, every single road in London according to poverty level. But they were doing all sorts of things. Um, when you look at some of the, oh, sorry, here's a more detailed map. You can see that the dark black um, are the high poverty areas and the red ones are the sort of the, the well-to-do areas. Um, and of course, they map very much onto today's uh, distribution of poverty in, uh, in London today. But what's fascinating, I guess I want to highlight, is the, the notebooks that underlie this kind of color coding that you see here. Um, some of the stories that are in there. So I'm just going to read this little story here. Um, her husband is 76 and she's 72, and the former is still good for a day's work. He's a, a sail hand at Hayes Wharf. His dinner was cooking, ready to be sent, three-quarter beef of pound of steak and a suet pudding, and he will eat it every bit. He has a good appetite and a good digestion, thank God. Pink on the map. So there's, there's all these kind of fascinating insights and stories. Um, I mean, this was a fairly happy one, but some are much darker about, you know, the police who were really the informants in this, who were telling about the particular prostitutes hanging out in certain areas and their perceptions of the, the untidy women. So there's all these amazing detailed ethnographic details behind these color codings. So I guess I'd like to argue that this is also an emotional cartography of a sense. And I think a lot of the sort of socio-demographic data we see nowadays about that kind of runs our lives that, you know, you as architects are maybe familiar with, I would argue that a lot of these are kind of emotional cartographies, even if they don't present themselves thus, even though they look like um, very straightforward governmental data visualizations. And just to take this into where we enter sort of emotional cartography territory, so discussions in the 1950s and 60s, um, there's this great paper by Dennis Wood where he talks about two different geographies that all, that both arose in the sort of 1950s and 60s, where he talks about um, Kevin Lynch um, and Guy Debord, and he's kind of opposing these two approaches. So I'm just going to take you through them just as a sort of introduction. So um, most architects are sort of familiar of this, this work, um, the image of the city. What Kevin Lynch was doing is um, he was going and doing, collecting mental maps from people. So uh, asking people to write descriptions um, and do drawings of their mental maps of areas. And then he was aggregating them to produce these kind of representations that pull together different people's um, mental maps. And what I think is fascinating about them is that he really focused on these particular um, typology instruments, you know, like paths, edges, districts, nodes, landmarks, which were the sort of elements he identified from these kind of maps. Um, and Dennis Wood kind of argues that um, this kind of, this is basically the aspects of a city that could be shaped by city government. The co controlling characteristics of people's images that Lynch attends to were legibility and in imageability, both of which governments could shape. So he's suggesting that that kind of way of creating mental maps from people are almost the way that kind of governments see cities in the sense that they are the sort of the elements that can be shaped, transferred into a mental map. And he kind of compares this with the sort of uh, situationist approaches of psychogeography where they were very much coming from trying to explore the city in new ways and trying to drift across the city in the reeves to try and understand what they call, you know, the sudden changes of ambience in the street within the space of a few meters, the evident division of a city into zones of distinct psychic atmospheres, the path of least resistance, which is automatically followed in aimless stalls, which has no relation to the physical contour of the world, the appealing or repelling character of certain places, all this seems to be neglected. So a lot of what the situationists were interested in were these kind of, these experiences and feelings that we have in the city that are not turned into legitimate representations. And they were trying to document them in these kind of um, maps. And Simon Sadler suggests that, you know, this is, um, 
they, they have a very different aim. They directed us to obscure places to elusive ambient effects and partial artistic and literary perceptions, uh, precedents for the sublime. If we feel frustrated at the efforts required to put them all together, we'd miss the point. Psychogeography was a reverie, a state of mind. It represented a drift from the ideal and the rational to the extraordinary and the revolutionary. So I just, I guess I'm trying to oppose the sort of Kevin Lynch um, idea of a mental, of a mental map and a city that can be rationalised with a psychogeographical map, which um, is about trying to understand sort of the the hidden, um, potentially political agendas of these kind of ambiances that are not being recorded. And I think that kind of tension between the the drive to rationalise. And the, the drive to, to, to find some kind of politics um, within the sort of the emotional cartography is something that I'm going to talk about in a sort of modern update of it. So if we move into sort of more modern era, what I think is interesting is that there's a sort of move away from the, the narration, the mental map as something that's kind of drawn by hand towards various kind of instruments that might be able to extract people's mental images from their heads. So you have these kind of, a lot of these kind of technologies starting to be applied in research to try and think about how do we react to walking through the city. So lots of people are setting up simulations, you know, asking people to, to imagine walking through the city while being in these kind of scanners or actually showing them simulated cities and seeing how they're reacting to particular encounters in the city um, while strapped up to various equipment. And in some ways, there's a return to some kind of earlier um, sensing equipment. So this is the, the classic lie detector, which is using this kind of straps across his chest, which measure um, his breathing rate, um, the, the blood pressure on his arm, and galvanic skin response, which is the thing on his fingers, which is what I'm going to be talking about later. So the, the whole idea of this kind of logic is that the guy behind the laptop is asking kind of control questions, you know, like, what did you have for breakfast? You know, do you, do you like going swimming as control questions? And then, you know, did you murder your wife? To try and see how this person's body is reacting to these kind of questions. So a lot of these sensors are being deployed in quite an instrumental way. Um, and it's interesting how it's, it's really intersecting with um, a lot of the internet, um, social media type, uh, scraping and also app type things. So this is an app called Mappiness, for example, that's asking people, you know, to rate their feelings and how happy they are, how relaxed. And this this thing is something that you install on your phone, and it's it kind of it it buzzes you at random times during the day, asking you to record your happiness. Um, and these are then produced to uh, used to kind of create these happiness meters across the UK and uh, across the world and. There's this whole agenda to try and um, create a, a sort of a universalized idea of um, of happiness as something that can be easily extracted. And there's this interesting uh, correspondence between these um, modern uh, social media memes with these kind of uh, biophysiological measures that are being combined. So just to show you how these kind of things are being imagined within urban planning. Uh, for example, here is that on a particular layer, although, however, although available in SimCity is not yet implemented in commercial applications, this layer called Aura layer provides information on the mood or emotions of people. We argue that spatial geocoded emotional data on citizens can provide increased benefits to city planning. We propose ways how such a layer could be, become reality. So a lot of these kind of metaphors are actually coming from computer games and sort of futuristic ideas on how <clears throat> how society might be governed and, and are kind of making their way into city planning ideas and urban planning. So it's literally this idea of an emotional layer that can be put across the world in the same way as you might have an infrastructure layer of you know underground sewer systems, for example. Um, and I think the, the really interesting implication within this is that the intention is that test persons do not just add subjective impressions as suggestions to planning processes, 
but objective, measurable, physiological response data which reflects the somatic emotional condition in the urban context. So, you know, what I find fascinating with this approach is often this, this division that's made between the subjective, you know, and the objective. So they, the idea of these sensors are often to try and get at this objective measurement of, of experience in some way. And I think that's very deeply embedded in this idea of creating this, this kind of um, layer that underlines can be extracted from this stuff, it doesn't require people to talk. So this is all kind of build up for um, the project I want to talk to you about, which is what I've been doing for uh, almost a decade. Um, this is the, the biomapping device that I developed um, in about 2000, 2001. And it does use indeed a physiological sensor. So that thing on the finger there is a little sensor cuff that measures the sweat level on your fingers. Um, but instead of a kind of someone who asks you control questions, you know, in a lie detector context, what you have is you have it put together with the GPS. So essentially what happens is that people get wired up with this gear, they carry a GPS unit, um, and there's these sensors on their hands, and they go for a walk like this. And when they come back, we download the data, and we start talking about it. And for me, this is where the real magic happens in this kind of social context um, where people start seeing their own physiological data as this kind of graph, almost like a cardiogram. Um, and in, in talking about it, they're starting to make sense what these kind of spikes might mean. So a spike here means an increased physiological response. So here it's a fairly obvious one. There's a busy traffic crossing which is what the person was responding to. You know, their body was creating some kind of physiological reaction which could be detected, which created the spike in the Google Earth in this case, can be visualized in this way. And then in talking about it, they were making sense and adding these annotations. But what's fascinating is really the range of different experiences that create these kind of spikes. You know, everything from road crossings to having an argument this was a, a younger woman going for a walk with her mum and she was arguing near the supermarket with her mother but she was also at the other point there um, she remembered that she has driving lessons at this particular point and she sort of suggests this is what what caused that particular spike there so again what i think is fascinating is when these things are aggregated together um, in this way, put them together in, in a sense. These are just overlay. This is a hundred people's uh, walks put together um, in Greenwich, which is a part of London. So it's a fairly small part. So this is all walking distance stuff. Um, this was organized as a sort of community art project. Um, Greenwich is an area that's undergoing lots of uh, regeneration slash gentrification. So there's a really interesting context for people to walk this area to bring together their, their experiences of what it is now and what it was in the past and what it might be in the future. But what's interesting is once you start aggregating the stuff into a, a layer in this sense, a, a sort of cartographic layer, is you have all these um, points overlaid with each other. So you have the argument with mum, difficult conversation but you also have these longer stories like Sainsbury's have, have made a bit of an effort, not just to be green and ecologically sound, but also to make a bit of a peaceful oasis at the back of their store. I've gone there a few times beyond that. I've never ever seen anybody using it. Um, what I think is, is fascinating is that um, what happens when you, when you produce these as, as maps. So this became an, a Greenwich emotion map that I published and kind of distributed. So this particular map takes the format of the, the official institutional uh, cartographic maps that you can buy normally in anywhere in the UK, but we use that format to produce this kind of artistic map of an area with, of course, rather different cartography. Um, and I, I guess the, the point I want to illustrate is that despite the fact that there's an, an emotional layer here, I think it's doing something slightly different from the sort of the more extractive 
um, methods I showed you before, in that it, it creates a sort of an embodied and situated representation of the city where we experience the city through a mix of senses, but also memories, stories, interaction and encounters. Um, and this image I put here is a sensory homunculi, which is quite a nice image where basically they, they mapped the, the amount of the, the brain that's actually responsible for, for processing parts of your sensory experiences. So there's a huge amount of your brain dedicated to, to touch and a lot to your taste and to sight but very little to, you know, most of your body. So my, my suggestion is that perhaps this, this, this kind of approach is starting to get close to a sort of sensory and embodied view of what the city might be allowing us to experience. Something that has these different senses kind of mixed together, muddled together, and also prioritizing certain ones that we do experience as we, as we encounter the world. Um, but for me, there's a sort of sense-making aspect in this that's very important, which I think is missed um, in some of this earlier approach of trying to rationalize this, in the sense that that moment of talking about one's map, seeing it, seeing one's data represented in there and adding annotations, it creates this kind of combination of the, the physiological data with the, the, the sense-making data to become something new. And there's a very particular performativity there um, where the people are not narrating by themselves, but they were performing together with the spikes of the arousal data. So I think the, the key point I'm trying to make here is that there's a, there's a co-performance taking place where um, people are constructing stories with this data, you know, the, the physiological um, arousal data that this thing is all based on is very noisy it's it creates a lot of spikes but what's important is that people experience this for themselves and are choosing to disclose certain certain stories with with their own consent with their own desire to tell it in a public sense to to kind of create a, a communal representation of something so there's a performativity there which is ultimately absent in some of these um, other approaches that we looked at, you know, whether we're talking about Kevin Lynch or whether we're talking about some of these extractive emotion layer approaches. So the sense that, that people are performatively and participatory way working with the data to construct narratives and representing the area for themselves was something that I really discovered from doing these projects. Um, and to give you, to show you a few more examples of this. Um, this was in San Francisco, where I worked for about two months, something of that sort. Uh, and in a small area of San Francisco. And what you see is, um, well, let me go back one step. You see essentially the grid pattern of the city, which is sort of absent from European cities. But what's interesting is when you look at the sort of density so the colored dots are the physiological arousal, but you see this mass of textual annotations over the top of it. You know, I really like the mural with the bears listening and laughing, very relaxed. Murals and talking about eating dirty tacos and drinking beer. Guys sequencing techno music in the garage, said hello to a stranger, ran into my massage th therapist, could see the guy on the stretcher. Really nice street, lots of trees and nice shadows, contemplated turning off took photo of my old house, mural walk, where the wild things are mural. Lots of murals of them were crude, but some were nice. The last one had Indian gods. So that little road, which has got sort of the brighter colors there is actually what they call a mural road. Essentially, these are roads with graffiti on. And they're, they're really known to lots of locals, but um, they don't actually appear on any of the official maps of San Francisco. So this is very much an insider map, but it's something that people really cared about. Um, and where lots of interactions were taking place around these uh, mural roads, these graffiti roads. Um, and I, I just loved the, the kind of tension between sort of the personal experiences and the sort of things in the road that, that anybody can see. Um, you can see, for example, here, one of the points. Um, 
Bar was playing Total Eclipse of the Heart. This song gets me every time. At the Odeon, looking at an ex-girlfriend's house. I was remembering a person I had a major relationship with whose parents lived here. So it's, it's fascinating how these particular spikes, these particular moments of attention were very much personal, but they were in the city, they were important. You know, this is really what was much more important to that person than the, the architecture, for example. So a lot of the a lot of the sort of Kevin Lynch ideas that there's sort of structures within the city that are kind of totally constructing our shaping our our experience of the city. But here these were very much personal um, remembrances of, of their encounters. You know, this is where I had the bike accident um, mixed together with the most beautiful street ever. So this is really kind of fascinating combination, this density of these different encounters in this cartography. So yeah, as I was saying before, there's a, there's a kind of co-construction taking place in this, in this approach, I would say. So for Lynch and the emotional layer approach, the city is shaping human behavior. It's a one-way direction. People are functioning as kind of sensors to, to produce these kind of universal way markers um, or critical, critical things that can be extracted that are going to be going to be universal. You know, the architecture is said to be totally shaping people's experience. Whereas I, I would argue in, in psychogeography and the sort of biomapping approach, the city and the people are acting to kind of co-construct the city. So while, you know, while we're all happy to, to think that, of course, cities are, are social constructs, are cultural constructs, those are hardly ever represented in, in the cartography of the city. So as urban planners, you know, I, I, I would think I would challenge people how how they can really represent the sort of the the sense that that they recognize cities are living entities but really make that into a graphical representation through the the mediums and the tools they use um so just to show you another map um this is the east paris emotion map um this is a, a little part of the cemetery. Felt angry, lots of people steal flowers from the graves. There was a sign on the tomb, please don't steal the flowers from the graves. I empathize because I bring flowers here. Homosexual part of the cemetery, even during the day. Famous graves mixed with normal people. Saw a fresh grave of 15 year old with a big photo of him skiing or sad. Very good smell from the blooming, blossoming trees discovered a new grave with a statue of a pelican. Uh, it's a very interesting, you know, this is one of the oldest cemeteries in Paris, and it's a very, very interesting way of thinking about what is it we take from, from these kind of places. And there, there is a sense where we want to grab at the universal, we want to have the, the universal pattern of this, but I, I wonder if what is really lost in trying to grab the universal patterns, these kind of encounters. So, you know, I, uh, this particular workshop, I think it had about 30 people taking part. So, you know, this is not done with enormous amounts of people. Some of the other workshops some of the other maps I showed you, they had a hundred people taking part, often going for a walk. So these are not massive representational populations, but they do give you a very important sense of place that I think is lost in many large scale universalizing methods. And they give you some very, they show you something very particular, I would say. So here's a square in Paris where you, know, you had two different political demonstrations taking place on one day. So you had a Berber demonstration with don't trust the media posters like, like the Chinese demonstration so there was a Chinese demonstration in the same square earlier in the day, which was then later replaced by a Berber demonstration um, on a different agenda. Um, so I think that that's fascinating how you, you get this kind of temporal turnover, which becomes embedded within this um, 2D flat cartographic map like this. Um, here's some other details. So <clears throat> what I want to suggest is that the sort of process and representation 
so the process of making and constructing this with people and the representation need to be interwoven. So they're interwoven in the construction of a map, but they also need to be represented as being interwoven, which is something that I'm really aiming at with, with presenting these, these cartographic representations. So you see that the, the representations are different for all the cities. And for me, that's very important because the processes were different and the, the dynamics were very, very different taking place. Um, this is Stockport, which is a small town near Manchester. And I'll show you some details of it. Uh, Stockport has, a, has an issue in that a lot of the young people are leaving to go to Manchester. And a lot of the, the old people are kind of very nervous about the young people. So you have the, the Stockport Scally and you have you know young people represented by older people as the um, as the sort of the girl with a pineapple haircut. So what you see in this particular map is the the emotional data as these kind of pillars that kind of go across the the map. But you also have these kind of drawings. So what I'm trying to show you is that these drawings were done by local people who participated in the project. So the representation has changed from these kind of uh, maps that were, you know, essentially the physiological data and people talking about them to starting to allow people to get more involved in representing their own local area. So for me, in order to capture, for example, this, this tension between the, the generational conflict in Stockport, it was very important to, to get people to, to visualize it, to draw it for themselves. So these drawings that this whole map is composed of were all done by local people. So I was there with my, with my partner. We were in the, um, in the local market for a number of days, asking people to do drawings on a number of topics. And based on these kind of drawings, we were essentially extracting them and reconstructing the whole of the city out of their drawings mixed together with the, the physiological data that we, we took from these emotion mapping um, workshops. So together, the city becomes this strange construction of their physiological data as these kind of three-dimensional pillars with drawings that are kind of constructing the city and these textual uh, narrations. This is the shopping street, for example, which becomes represented through these drawings of CCTV cameras and people pushing shopping carts. Um, and I, I guess that my suggestion is that there's a, there's an attempt to to work with the representation in a way that that constructs something very particular out of this particular out of this place. Um, Stockport is a is an is an amazing old industrial city that really grew up because of the the cotton mills that were centered around the center of town um, and they were covered up the river was essentially covered up with the shopping area so nowadays there's very little evidence of the actual river that was there so the the visual representation of this map tries to cover tries to capture this industrial visual language of the town, which has been kind of lost and kind of constructed in a, in a new way that kind of creates this, the sense of these, these sensor systems, the physiological data, but also the, the hand-drawn qualities of all the people. So, so I guess what I'm trying to get at is that, is a shift in my own process of recognizing there's a there's a need to kind of develop a visual language that gets closer to the methodological way of working with people that that captures the, the performative quality that, that's taking place that that brings together this this dislocated sense of being in multiple realities and multiple spaces at the same time you know being in the modern era with lots of mobile phones smartphones but also being this kind of city which was constructed out of a historical industrial revolution era um, context. And this is what these sort of maps try to capture. So th they have a slightly grander agenda than, than simply um, 
than simply a snapshot of a place. They try to tell a sort of history and try to create a history for a place. And um, the Brentford biopsy was a project where we decided to, you know, a biopsy is, is essentially when you take living tissue from somebody to try and analyze um, what might be what might be going wrong in the body. And this is the sort of metaphor we were taking in the sense we were trying to take a biopsy of a of a place to see what might be wrong or what might be the issue with Brentford. Um, so it's a sort of medical examination of a, of a place. And what you see here is is very different sort of visual language, I would say. You still have the sort of drawings here, but the, the biomapping stuff takes much more of a back air, back seat, if you like. So the, the red dots you see in this map are the sort of biomapping, but you have all these other sort of visualizations on top of it. So this really kind of engages with the built environment, trying to think about the history of, of Brentford, how the old and the new don't really interact. Um, people, community, class and fictions. So this really was derived from uh, people's drawings, people's, people's issues. So the way we set up this, this exhibition is that we, we worked, um, I bought a, a very large scale printer, which we could use to, to print this 10 meter long banner. And we set it up as an open gallery. So people would come in and would work with us, would do drawings, would tell us stories. We would scan in their drawings and print them out. And then they would kind of keep iterating and crossing them out, adding to them. And then we would scan them in again, print them out again. So this was an iterative process of really involving the public in creating this biopsy of their local area and trying to understand how things were related so these kind of strange diagrams you see in the center are a sense of trying to understand the relationship between, you know, public space and, you know, the high street should be pedestrianized, nobody walks here. We need more local shops and restaurants. At night, the area dies. So I guess the story I'm telling you is that there's a sort of interesting shift in this project, which started off as a sort of an art project about, um, essentially designing a device and actually became a sort of urban planning in a sort of strange, in a strange shift that took place over a sort of 10 year process, where these kind of issues are very much um, ones that, you know, urban planners are, are familiar with, you know, ending up to a point where, where people were drawing future visions of of Brentford, everything from climate change, submerging Brentford to coming up with practical uh, solutions to, um, you know, the problem of, of the nobody is kind of stays in the local area anymore. So I, I guess the the thing that that, that prompted the shift into this um, alternative public consultation processes was the fact that the kind of work I was doing with the physiological arousal data is it was not taken particularly seriously by urban planners and architects. They were excited by it but they wanted to, um, they didn't quite know how to use it, didn't know how to work with it. And whenever I presented the actual representations, they were, um, you know, I had lots of handshaking with politicians, but there was never any attempt to take it particularly seriously or to work with it in, a, in a, an explicit way. And instead what I found by creating of my, creating these, these alternative consultation processes, is that we could actually talk about this and get to the point where they, the planners had to take it seriously because we were starting to use their language and we were starting to talk about issues and talking about their kind of domain in a way that they were, that were engaged and had to, had to take part in. So this ended up being displayed in the, in the local town, uh, town hall, I think. Um, and you know, we had hundreds of people involved in this and it was really a, a way of, of doing these consultations that didn't necessarily need public authority anymore, but took place through other means. So I'm, I'm really interested in these kind of other processes that might, that might take place in parallel with, um, with official consultations. Um, um, 
maybe I'll get back to it later. And just kind of on that tip, maybe I'll just talk about this project. This was in Bethlehem, um, USA. So this is in Pennsylvania. And this was fascinating in a similar kind of way in that the project directly involved the local council. It, it tried to be on, uh, on a direct level of trying to work with them to, to see where we could get to. Um, in that we really tried to identify particular areas that needed to be changed. So that, um, for example, this is a particular bridge that was, you know, I don't know if you can see in the small image, but basically there's no provision for walking at all. So this was organized by the university and by working directly with the local mayor and the economic development team, in that particular context, it made sense to, to have them directly involved in the project to bring them into this process of working from the body into the political. Um, you know, the mayor was wired up um, in, the, in the project. He was taking part, he was filmed for the local news, uh, walking through the city while wired up, talking about his experiences of, of the steel works that were where his whole family had been working for many generations, which were now old and disused and a lot of the, the local steel workers were now homeless. Um, so he was walking through the area of the steel works while wired up, looking at his own map and the spikes of his own bodily responses to this, this industrial area that was now the crux of the sort of the economic problem that the, that the local mayor had to deal with. So there's something about working with the politics through the body that can work, when you work directly with authorities, it can do something interesting. It can identify particular dynamics that can be addressed. So there was a, a plan drawn up on how to you know, improve uh, pedestrian facilities, for example, in this area and the urban food desert, but also it can be used as a sort of an alternative planning process that, that works through different means that gets uh, a public to come together around the issue of the place itself. So they're the two ways that I think are interesting to work is both to, to work with official processes and to, to bring new approaches into them, but also to kind of offer alternative models that, that have a sort of public publicness that needs to be addressed. So I guess the sort of normative framework I want to present to you is, is a way of working with emotional cartography. The, um, revisit some of the discussion between Kevin Lynch, psychogeography, sort of the emotional layer and the sort of work I've been doing and trying to think about how we, how we do better how we do better participatory engagement, how we do better representations of emotions of feelings in cities and how we really use them for, for changing the cities into areas that we want to live in. So Bruno Latour, the, the philosopher I mentioned at the beginning from this text, how to talk about the body, he really suggests that we ought to use these criteria. So these criteria are to some extent taken from this paper. We should think about, is the process interesting for the participants as well as the researchers? And are, are the resulting articulations interesting? So he uses this word interesting to mean this idea of affected, of creating change. You know, is the, is the process Affective, is it interesting for the participants? Is it changing them? Are they involved in this? Are they, do they want to be part of this? And are the resulting articulations interesting? Do they create new relationships that are not there beforehand? So I think that's an interesting one to use when you think about, you know, Kevin Lynch to begin with, you know, is the process really interesting for the participants when they take part in his mental mapping processes? I'm not entirely sure. I'm not sure how how interesting the, the resulting articulations, you know, the maps you produced really are. But I think that's an interesting criteria we ought to use. You know, how how interesting were the psychogeographical drifts? 
I'm not sure. I, I can't say, but I can certainly tell you what what happens with some of the um, some of the emotional layer work that I was kind of trying to trying to talk in relation to, where. Um, just to give you one incident, in one of the papers they talk about one of the researchers walking through a park and accidentally stepping into a big dog poo. And what's fascinating is that this is a this is something that really occurs all the time in in the maps I've been producing. You know, the, the dog poo becomes this desire for local people wanting to map dog poo areas. And yet within the sort of emotional layer approach, the, the dog poo on the floor was basically thrown away as a sort of blip, as this incident, this this little something that caused something but had to be thrown away. Whereas in the sort of emotion, well, in the sort of, in my view of what an emotional cartography is, something like the dog poo on the floor is valid, is important and needs to be held onto. Um, it is something that's interesting for the participants, for local residents. And also, you know, representing dog poo on on public maps, areas where dog poo happens, I think is important. You know, these are not just things that we can throw away in the interest of, of the kind of universal legibility. So that that kind of process of where we where we take our own interest, what kind of maps represent, where where we are interested, you know, where our interest as researchers lies, I think is important. So maybe that's the second point already. Does the process render talkative what was previously mute? You know, what do these representations make make visible? What do they what do they make talkable, talkative? You know, I, I talked about the dog poo, but I think it's very much about people's experiences and memory, the way they're embodied in places. Um, as well as sort of local histories that are lost and local places and um, practices that are kind of often neglected in these in these representations which I think is what a lot of the the psychogeographical work um, that Guy Debord and his followers were interested in you know they saw Paris around them changing they saw that Paris was being gentrified and they were trying to trying to excavate some previous histories of of Paris and they were trying to both hold on to that that history but also trying to think about the lived practice that that they felt was being obliterated and was not being taken care of in the um, by the urban planning that was taking place so how do we make the sort of the lived life talkative um, and how do we stop it being muted you know I think it's it's fascinating that quote from the emotional layer approach where it talks about wanting to replace the subjective um, comments from people in consultations with objective um, measurements taken from their body. You know, I think to me that's, that's completely wrong. You know, we do not want to make the public uh, participants mute. I think we want to find ways of, of allowing them to be talkative in a way that it's reflexive and it's, um, it's critical and it's, it creates a, a, a new possibility. Um, and I think that the third point here is about does the process maximize its own disputability? You know, how, how can you argue against it? Um, in some ways, the sort of artistic representations I've been producing um, for a lot, for a long time, in some ways they are very easy to dispute. And I, I set them up in a way that they can be easily disagreed with and can be easily argued against. Um, they are artistic processes in the sense that they're often hosted by art institutions. And, you know, often I'm, I'm prepared to dispense with them. So I'll give you one other story. When I was working in, in Munich um, with my biomapping equipment and I was offering to, to wire up some people and there were a group of um, Munich anarchists who came along and they were very interested in the project but they totally refused to be wired up to the devices. And instead they went away and came back with some really fascinating papers, which really showed, um, there, were, there were historical papers from, I think the 1930s, where they talked about biometric control systems that were being set up in Germany in preparation for some of the later political control systems. So they were really arguing that a lot of this sort of the mechanisms of control 
uh, were biometric and were being set into place at that particular time. And they did not want to be wired up to the devices because they felt that there was a there was almost a public preparation towards other forms of biometric control that are being you know instituted right now so the workshop ended up you know we we threw we basically put away my sensing devices and we end up looking through the texts and arguing and having discussions about you know what it means to experience these sensor systems and to use these sensors to to articulate one's own body so i, I you know my suggestion is that that approach is is very important for allowing people to dispute the methods that are being used to articulate the city and to to challenge what it might mean to to talk about emotions and to create cartography out of people's emotions you know and i think it's very hard in contrast to to argue with the sort of um social media based scraping which is taking place these days where um, people are looking for semantic analysis, they're looking for particular affective phrases for, for areas to try and see where are the hot spots um, for particular positive words to, to try and do something on those or to try and, you know, <clears throat> it's, it's a big, it's a big, it's a big conceptual drive, this idea of aggregative, aggregative semantic scraping. And I guess how can we dispute the logic of this you know if we as individuals only exist as a data point within these kind of large data sets i think it's very hard to dispute the the epistemology of these approaches you know they cannot they essentially they do not have an approach it's just a, a big data epistemology of quantity of data so you know if you talk about the sort of where the where the dispute can take place if you're there as a as a physical person people can people can argue against the devices i've developed you know do they really work what do they measure um and i'm there as a physical entity that can be that can be argued with whereas with these kind of large-scale data scraping that's taking place it's it's very hard to find a way of disputing them and to have a real point of of entry into creating new um political dialogue so I guess what I'm trying to do with this, these three questions is to suggest that um, they can be thought more generally about public processes around urban planning, around about all sorts of all sorts of architectural issues, all sorts of public issues, all sorts of dynam dynamics of of public um, controversy. That maybe reach a little bit beyond emotional cartography but i do think they have a very particular specific focus to think about what emotion can do um, and how we use it so to kind of get back to um the initial question i was asking you know how 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 does some city makers feel and how can we or how should we use our feelings to make cities i think this is a a way of thinking about feelings as this kind of contested um, space that we can we can work with uh, in a particular political setting and you know just a reminder this is the um this is the paper that i was kind of talking through um, where there's a little bit more detail and i realized that i've actually finished earlier than i had even anticipated so if it's okay i'll stop sharing we can have a discussion uh, for now, but I can always go back to some um, to some other slides if people had um, points they want to raise. Sure, sure. Very inspiring your lecture. Thank you. Oh, so many ideas and questions and possibilities. Uh, I believe you also received uh, like a feedback on your method, how it can be applied in different areas. Great. Yeah, I'm just reading it. So uh -huh. just so maybe just just kind of one step back. Um, so we've there's lots. I'm sure there's lots of uh, clarifying questions that people want to ask. You know, how does it work? What can you do with it? Those kind of things. Uh, so I'm happy to have clarifying questions as well as bigger theoretical discussions. But maybe I'll just answer this one from now. Yeah, yeah. Veronica. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
Um, very interesting, useful study. What do you think about the possibility of the emergence of interactive urban modules that would be integrated into the environment and act as a visible, audible, felt and environmental reaction or response to the emotional background of the people currently there? The automatic change of the environment, depending on the prevailing emotional background, the possible correlation of this background with the help of such a module. Um, is Veronica there? Oh, yes. So, yeah, I kind of... Um, so if I understand correctly, what you're suggesting is a sort of higher, is a sort of real time feedback system, right, whereby something might be measuring something and then you might be interacting with that. Is that what you're saying? Uh, sorry, it's a little hard for me to speak English. <laughs> sorry. Um, Okay, maybe I'll just answer it now and just you, you see if, if the answer is, is interesting. Um, maybe what, I'm, what I've been trying to get at is that emotion is a, is a complicated thing. It's not, um, it's not easy to, well, emotion is a contested thing. So there's lots of different methods. We might think about what feelings and emotions are and how we might measure them. So I think, Sorry, we've got a police car going by out there. Um, the, the, you know, the, this work I was doing has been, is now almost 20 years old in terms of starting point. And since then, lots of people have, have tried to think of ways of applying this in, in very different contexts. And this real time dynamic of something that um, has been of interest to many people. And, you know, I started off to begin with also looking at real time. But what I found was very much is that what was missing is that space of reflection that at least is important for me in the sense that it allows people to take a step back from the data and separate themselves from the visualization that's going on and to, to add something to the visualization. Um, so the way I was approaching it is often is to not have the real time moment. It certainly is something that's, that's doable if you're talking about the physiological senses, but I think you you lose something as well as gain something in in that yes. so you know there's i know there's lots of exhibitions where people are walking through and people are responding to you in real time and i think there's something exciting about that real time response but maybe it doesn't allow that that sort of slightly more critical reflection that i'm trying to that i'm trying to get at that that allows you to move towards you know things like urban planning but in certain contexts i think those kind of real-time sensors can be very exciting, especially if you do something very specific with them. I mean, maybe you have an example from your own work you want to say something about. No, we sometimes, uh, 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 we now have some uh, researchers uh, in this area. Uh, so <laughs> uh, it, uh, your research, it was very interesting for me. <laughs> so. That is my question uh, was made because we uh, do it now, <laughs> trying to do it. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's a good point. I mean, I think maybe what I'm trying to draw attention to is that um, a lot of the people focus on the sensors as if the sensor is the end point to the discussion. You know, I for for many years I used to get about five emails every single day from students wanting to get hold of my technology, right? So there was a sense in which almost having the technology was the answer in a, in a way. And lots of people, you know, implement it in different ways. But I guess the, the thing I'm trying to draw attention to is that the thing that I've developed or the thing that I've learned or found interesting was really the methodology of working with people to, to make sense of, of, of the data and working with it in a particular way. So the social setup where people sit around together and talk in a group was very much important to me. You know, I, I tried in one-to-one -one sessions where people would just sit next to me and it was almost like a therapist relationship, you know, and that didn't, it didn't work at all very well. You know, I, I much preferred it in a kind of collective setting where people were talking with others in the local area. It, it had a very different dynamic. Um, other times, you know, I tried it where people were literally typing some comments into a computer. So it was just literally one person and a computer giving feedback. And it, it also had a very different dynamic. So maybe, you know, one thing I haven't talked about so much is the sort of all the iterative testing and trying out that, that, got, that was involved in this. But I, 
at least for the sort of um, the relational method that I was trying to set up, this seemed to be the, the best thing and it seemed to have evolved in a particular way. But there's lots of different ways in which you can stage work with sensors, but I think they create very different relationships. And I guess I'd love to add to the nuance that people have of talking about this way. It's not just the sensor, you know, it's not just wiring something up, putting some, putting your head into some, some scanner and you get some squiggly lines. Yeah. It's about what you do with the data, how you set up the, the, the larger context. Thank you. Okay. Are there any sort of basic clarifying questions you have about, you know, maybe what, how this thing works before we get into other things? We see uh, one more question from Yurate. Oh, yes. Again, thank you for a very interesting lecture. No, oh, thank you. Um, uh, part where you reconstructed the city from the drawings of people. Yeah. What are people in particular were asked to draw? How was the data analyzed? Or was it analyzing random drawings of a city? Right, um, yes. So that's a good question. I, it, it'll take me a little bit of time to find the actual drawing sheets, but I can give you a sort of my quick, um, my quick response to it. We were, uh, in that particular occasion, it was an iterative process where we tried different um, different things. So we'd have we'd have drawing sheets which were like an A4 sheet like this, and it would art, it would have a prompt at the top, and then it would have a space for people to do drawings, and the prompts were a series of questions, things like who were the most important people in the town, who were the most difficult people in the town. Who were the most, um, who were the angry people in the town? So there were a series of provocations that would take you into different directions. And um, some were really about places, you know, which were the most important buildings, which maybe heads a little bit more towards a sort of Kevin Lynch kind of um, area. But, you know, a lot of them were thinking, getting people to, to talk about their, um, that essentially, they were provocations to, for people to to be both playful, but to also provoke them into into some sort of like a, a, a graphical sociological analysis that they might actually enjoy doing, if you like. So they were sort of like playful provocations, and you know, we'd sit there with people. So it wasn't like we were not there. We'd see if, if certain things didn't work, and then we'd just scratch it out and we'd try try something else. So these kind of drawing sheets. Um, were analysed, you know, we'd get a few hundred of these and we'd take them home and we'd kind of look through them and we'd look for patterns. So we, you know, we did the sort of classic grounded theory type stuff, but we were doing a sort of visual analysis. There's lots of discussion of sort of, um, of drawings that are often around children's drawings. There's actually very little um, academic research on adult drawings, which I think is quite interesting. But we were looking at some of the sort of discussions about how you classify and, um, and analyze children's drawings. So we're using that to kind of really understand the themes of that. And based on that, we were kind of constructing the map in the sense that we were trying to geographically construct the map out of people's drawings. So, you know, the river is actually where the river geographically goes, but, and the buildings are where they geographically go, but the people are not of course, not geographically placed, but they're placed in certain areas. So like we might get a shopping, someone, you know, pushing a shopping cart, for example, and that was kind of replicated multiple times to become the shopping area. So there is a sort of creative license in the sense that, you know, people didn't draw a hundred shopping carts, but we maybe replicated the shopping carts a number of times. So there's a, there's a sense in which we were sort of illustrating with the sort of patterns that we'd found in, um, in people's drawings. I hope that that's clear enough. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so, what about lies of people? So, yeah. Okay. So that's a that's a great question because I used to get it all the time. So um, this is sort of the the um, the the lie detector is very much premised on the idea of a of a lie in the sense that you have a you have a basis, you know, you're asking the person, did you murder your wife? Did you murder your husband? Where you have a clear idea of what a lie means. Now, when you're talking about um, going for a walk for an hour with a device, which measures your physiological arousal, 
what what is a lie um in the sense that the the idea of lying um becomes it's it's a it's very much a contextual thing you know i had people trying to game the system trying to play around with it and that was actually very important for people to 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 experiment with it so i had you know teenagers who would for example try and shock each other they would kind of Climb, go up behind the other one and scare the other one to try and see if they could make spikes appear in the diagram or other people would try and do things like jump into a swimming pool or jump into some water or you know do something to try and trigger emotional reactions and that was certainly important but what I found very much is that people would often come back multiple times so often the first time people would come and they didn't know what to do with it so they just went for a walk the second time people would sort of experiment with the device, they would do exactly that sort of experimentation, try and provoke each other to try and trigger these spikes. And then the third time people would actually use it. And that was really what I found fascinating. So they'd almost established a relationship with what, what they could maybe, what the spikes might record about their body in a sense. And they could use it to investigate certain areas that they were interested in. So they might want to go for a walk where, you know, they always go and play or places where that were important, meaningful to them. But they didn't necessarily do that on the first time they went for a walk. They really, you know, they had to, they had to do that sort of experimentation with the, with the technology before they placed that kind of trust into it to, to use it to kind of co-construct their experience with it. So, you know, maybe in the second time that they used the device, they were thinking about, you know, the equivalent of like, what were the lies or what does the, what does the technology disclose about me or what can I, what can I do with it? And I think at the third time they, they realized that this was doing something slightly different than the lie detector. It was um, as a sort of self-narrative device with place. And I think that's really what I found exciting is when people went through that sort of journey. But I don't know if that answers your question. Were you asking more specifically about the technology or tell me more about your, your thinking? It's Mary. Uh -huh. Who was asking? Oops. This? <laughs> Mary, yeah, 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 that's me. Uh, Hello. Yeah, it was about people who uh, start to manipulate with uh, in, 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 in exact situation and, and, and you won't get uh, the real result and maybe what is the real result uh, so that's that's what's about that what uh, about uh, i asked in mm -hmm. fact you answered it that, yeah. that people manipulate uh, with devices and uh, in and uh, and we get different results then yes so uh, in fact uh, the, the, re the real uh, situation is something between first and the last time uh, of using it, yes? Well, you know, like, I'm not sure there is a real in this. I mean, let me give you another example. So let me give you some extremes of, of people kind of finding it interesting. So the, I'm, I remember one person who came back and they basically had, um, they basically had one big spike and then nothing. And they were really disappointed, like what happened here? And it turned out this is the point when actually they disconnected the cable. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, okay, so what do you expect if you disconnect the cable? But actually, you know, it identified that particular point. And the reason they disconnected it is because they met somebody they really, you know, felt embarrassed about wearing that, that device in front of them. They didn't want to be seen having this weird thing on their hands. So they put it in their pocket and put the whole thing away. So I would argue is that that particular spike identified that particular social occasion where they met this person despite the fact that it wasn't recorded anymore afterwards in the device, the device was a trigger for them to actually talk about that particular moment that was important, right? So the question of real, I would, I, I would position the real in the sort of the narration of, of the particular walk. I would not position the real in the sort of data, if you like, in the data, the squiggly line. But the real is something that's kind of constructed, in my opinion, in how people want to talk about this, you know, and people did it very differently. So some people, some people really don't want to talk about it at all. I had some people who kind of come back and they see a lot of squiggly lines and they look at it and go, yeah, <laughs> you know, and it's like, okay, so you don't want to talk about it, fine. And then I've had other people who you, you couldn't stop them 
you know they really wanted to explain every single little peak so uh, for me that that way of narrating for them becomes the real it becomes a way of making sense of the experience you know for some for that one person they were quite happy just to see a bunch of squiggly lines and that was that was the real for them that we're happy with for other people they wanted to make this very complicated detailed narrative of all the things that happened to them so for me that's that's the sort of the, the creation of the real if you like okay thanks and uh, if i may add actually a pe person is uh, more complex than just true and lie it's a fantasy what it's like no it's also a part of it, uh, his personality. So maybe we should uh, broaden our understanding of what is the lie, uh, real life. Uh, uh, coming back to iteration, if I may to ask, uh, have you tried to work together with a participant and to make an audio record of his story? In situ? Yeah, I mean, uh... I tried that. I've tried it, and I found it's it's different. Um, it it creates something very different. So, I mean, maybe I should maybe I should take a little bit of a step back. And I think it's quite important. Like I I didn't develop this for other people. I developed this for me in the sense that, you know, I developed this while I was at at the Royal College of Art. I was a student, and I I. You know, I didn't even know if this thing was safe, right? You know, I wasn't taking something that was off the shelf. I was putting electronics together and I was wearing my wiring myself up. So I was, you know, building all the electronics myself and putting nine volts into my fingers, seeing, you know, would would I get a heart attack? You know, and I, I had to feel confident wearing this thing for a week by myself that I wasn't going to hurt anybody before I wear it. And the same way that I wanted to make sure that it was actually detecting something meaningful. So I used to wear this for many months just to see what it would do in my own life. And I guess I I tried lots of different ways of working with it. And I I found when I was going for a walk um, and talking, I just was, it was making me too hyper aware of, of wearing this particular device. And I, I just, I guess I wasn't, I wasn't in the place anymore. And I, you know, just simply, you know, it's it's almost like a sort of slightly schizophrenic position where you're literally having to comment on every on every moment. You know, what what is what is meaningful if you're asked to kind of narrate. Um, I found that moment of of looking at data creates an interesting surprise in the sense that you you see spikes where you didn't expect them, but you also recognize certain particular moments. So, you know, the thing that people tend to do is they tend to, they, they tend to remember maybe two or three things that happened to them and they tend to look, was there a spike there? And then if they find a spike, they go, great. And then they think like, what are some of these other spikes? And you find, you know, I think you mentioned going for a walk with somebody else. Something that I found was really fascinating is um, conversational turn-taking spikes appearing. So when you had two people who are wired up together they were not supposed to walk, go for a walk together, but often people who went for a walk together, you would see when one person was talking, they would have a spike, and while the other person was listening, and then they would swap over. So you would get this kind of strange intermittent kind of pattern of their conversation being displayed. And people would find that kind of fascinating, right, in the sense that they, they saw literally a specialized dissection of their discussion which was sort of about place, but also sort of relational, displayed as a geographical walk. So they found that kind of fascinating. So, you know, people use it in lots of slightly different ways than I intended to, but I found that sort of momentary real-time um, narration I didn't find particularly useful. Um, but, you know, just to say from my point of view that because I, I used to wear this a lot and it made me more sensitized even when I wasn't wearing the device. So for a long time, I became very, very aware of how, how I was walking through the city, right? It, it creates this very different perception 
you, you become more aware of what might be what might be affecting you and I kind of I started becoming more aware of little bits of sweating or a little bit more of kind of those moments so that it does you know using these technologies for a long way it can change your way of being and doing normal behavior in the city and I think that's quite exciting when you when you take it and adapt it into something that can can really change your way of doing things so and i think that's that's very different when you look at the sort of rationalist approach you know that that's taken from the sort of kevin lynch and the sort of emotional layer approach where, where it's trying to aim at some kind of uh, the you know the the sensing system that they use is not supposed to transform or affect you the way you 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 perceive the environment it's not supposed to change the population whereas i'm suggesting that these technologies can be used as a sort of way of training yourself in a way that you want to train yourself. So, um, you know, I, I guess I'm quite excited by the sort of late Foucault, he talks about technologies of the self. So I'm quite excited to, to see this as a way of, of self training yourself to become more sensitive and to become more um... conscious. Sorry, conscious. Yeah, more conscious of particular relations that one is involved in, right? Things inside your body, things in you have with other people, things in the environment. You know, where is the dividing line between your body, your skin, and what's inside you, what's outside? They, they, you, you start having a different relationship, and I think that's what I found really exciting with this, personally. But you are coming so close. Uh, you know, uh, my field is uh, phenomenology, phenomenology, and maybe you uh, know this Maurice Ponty Marlowe. And he's embodied this. Uh, in a way, you are approaching his uh, uh, from different perspective, but still uh, at the same point, like uh, becoming aware of your surrounding uh, full day <laughs> time. Oh, uh, we have Monica question, uh, live question. Monica, please. Yes, join. thank you so much, uh, Christian, for a very nice presentation. It was very interesting to listen. Uh, the idea of articulating something that is muted, has been muted previously, is especially interesting to me. And you have perhaps already answered this question um, earlier, but could you clarify if uh, the, the main possibilities that this um, device allows kind of to do is to draw out something from the history that's uh, that was important for that particular place and as well um, which you have perhaps answered already is uh, the fact that it kind of allows to connect to other people from that place and better understand of what is important uh, at the moment for that specific community. At least these two points are the, the, the ones that I was able to understand that it allows to do. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, you know, one of the things I'll, I'll just kind of the comparison I would make is to Stockport, the one I was showing you, which was the sort of the, the, the city that had the river running through it. One of the things that I think the council were interested in was to really see how, what role the history played within the place now, you know, how was it shaping the sort of living practice? And, you know, the, the stories they got were not necessarily that positive for the council, you know, that uncovered for, it talked about, for example, some Second World War graffiti that was, that, you know, during the war that people, the soldiers had put graffiti on the toilets and it had been there for more than 50 years. And then the toilet had recently, had recently been cleaned by the council and they got rid of this old graffiti, you know, more than 50 year old graffiti. So there's a sense in which the, the authorities were interested to see, you know, what role history Played, but it was a slightly different history that was being talked about. It wasn't necessarily the sort of industrial history. So, you know, what's fascinating is how different histories kind of overlay each other and there's certain kind of legitimate histories and certain illegitimate histories. So it was interesting how a lot of the stories I was getting was sort of the tensions around how history was being erased rather than necessarily sort of being able to tell you one, one history was, you know, was important in that way. Um, but yeah, I think it's a the best way to think about it is maybe as an ethnographic method, something that can be can be a complement to an ethnographic method. Um, there's a there's kind of there's an approach of sensory ethnography, for example, that you might find interesting. Um, 
I'm, I'm working at the moment with an artist who's working on um, on the whole conflict that was happening between Greece and Turkey with a, um, the whole kind of uh, sort of concentration camps that had been set up. And she's working with a lot of the dispossessed communities, for example, and we're working together and thinking about how do we how do we use emotion to to articulate this history and, and to kind of find new relationships and what this history is doing now. And she's using photography. So I guess you don't, my argument is you don't need to have the box with the census in order to do this, but I think there's something in the methodology that I've developed in terms of creating sort of a symmetrical relationship of a symmetrical way of using emotions and feelings that I think is translatable to lots of different contexts to think about how how history and how emotion are entangled and how they can act nowadays that I think can be applied to lots of different contexts that I think are, you know, for example, this artist, she was very, she's very interested in, um, in what's happening in the moment in Palestine. And she's, she's very concerned on, you know, how, how emotion is being used in those kind of contexts. So I think history and, and, and kind of emotion are so deeply entangled that I think it's a very interesting area to, to find new methods to unlock the sort of the dynamics of those. Does that, does that answer you? I don't know. Yes, um, you answered in detail. Thank you so much. Okay. Very interesting. Oh, I muted myself. Uh, I came across a question that uh, Christian, uh, you raised it. Uh, can we really blend together our emotions and experiences to construct a totally shared vision of a place. Yeah, I, I think it's a it's an open question, right? It's not something that that either I can answer. Or I think in some ways it shouldn't be answered. Um, um, thank you, thanks for the comment. Um, yeah, I, I think it's sorry. I was just commenting on Carolina's comment there. Um, I think this question of like, can we can we construct a, a shared a shared representation. I think it's something that the people need to be working on. And I think there's multiple overlaying representations and I think they don't necessarily coexist. Um, and I think what I'm trying to get at is that I'm very worried about things like the sort of emotional layer approach that, you know. Oh, oh. sorry, I think I was muted. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's uh, ex accidentally. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, so I was just saying that I think uh, you know I'm very concerned about this whole idea of a of a universal emotional layer approach, which you know we all have a shared a shared emotional experience that um, we we're supposed to partake in. I think the idea of constructing different representations is something that I'm I'm personally excited by. You know, I, I'm involved in why. Well, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm kind of very excited about groups that are kind of collecting archives of, of alternative histories and doing that in the current world where, you know, alternative histories easily get lost. So how do, how do we create an archive for these alternative histories of collective representation? I think it's very important. And, you know, there can never be one shared um, representation, but I think we can create a sort of a plurality of these representations that are in conflictual relationship that don't necessarily get resolved. But I guess I hope the sort of method I I kind of develop can contribute to a slightly different way of thinking about doing politics from the body upwards, which I think is something that um, has been politically theorized, but maybe hasn't been kind of found ways of doing visual representations of, or, or thinking about what it might mean to really do that. Um, you know, I, I guess I'm I'm interested in the kind of anarchist theory and how we how we build from social relationships other kinds of larger relationships. To, so to think of mechanisms that can start building um, tangible representations based on those kind of ideas, I think is very exciting. Yeah, for sure. This, you 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 remind me uh, there is a town in Sweden. Not shopping, a former industrial, also textile town. And uh, of course, after the industry moved away, it 
was like a dangerous place to live. But uh, the change uh, appeared when the scientists came to the town to investigate, research it, and local people realized that there is something very special because you know world famous scientists are coming to their town and looking and uh, discussing and uh, they're starting to be proud of a place and uh, uh, they managed to uh, uh, return the fame and uh, prosperous life into the city. And I see your method, method is like also in a way uh, to keep this uh, love to the place or to renew it of the local people. And maybe uh, your method is very uh, suitable and welcome in those uh, towns uh, which are in danger, like shrinking and uh, people leaving them. So uh, uh, to use your method to become aware of a place, it's a very big thing to do. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, that, no, I think that's a really great example you gave. Um, I think it's, um, I don't, I, let me give you some examples. I, I found it amazing. People don't seem to value local places in many ways that, that I found when I was working in, in areas. People would only take the project seriously sometimes once they saw CNN, for example, covering the project. As soon as they saw CNN covering the project, they were coming to the local project. There's a sense in which people need to have almost the, the national big media validation for something that something that's taken place locally is important um, and I think you know there's a lot of amazing localized distributed innovation that's taking place that needs to have almost this kind of strange reflective channel of, of having some kind of big scale um, you know validation in order to take seriously the innovation that's taking place in, in an area and for me I guess that's where Sometimes the technology can be very useful. You know, when I was developing the the biomapping stuff, it was a very um, it was seen as being very in innovative, and it was just before a lot of the smartphone stuff was coming about. And um, somehow the technology seemed to bring a certain agenda into it that would allow the sort of big new media organisations to take an interest in it. So having having CNN there, you know, was somehow. Some, something that was very important for a project, but also for the local area to be able to do something. So I do think there's a sort of strange uh, contradiction that you sometimes have to work with in terms of doing, doing local projects that require that sort of mediagenic spectacle sometimes in order to create local valuation of, of something. And, um, you know, I think there's a, I'll just talk a little bit of a project that I, I did in Denmark where, um, we were developing a town toolkit. So we were, work, we were working in this tiny little suburb of Copenhagen that was basically just a train station. So a train goes through it, you know, the trains, um, th th there's nothing else except a train station there really. It's a small town. And we were trying to set up a, a, a town toolkit that would allow almost cybernetic governance of this little town. And <laughs> what was fascinating about it is we, we set up these sensors that were measuring pollution levels in real time and allowed a real time voting system so people could vote uh, on lampposts on particular issues that they were involved in. So, and somehow the, the spectacle of, of setting those up and getting some media coverage made it important for local people to think about what was going on, right? And suddenly like the local politicians were getting involved in it and they became part of the project. So, um, Again, I guess a way of really thinking about um, changing something is you sometimes have to sort of fake it in the media before it becomes real and sometimes the stakeholders get involved in it. So that would be the sort of the advice I would give to other people who are doing this in the sense you have to you have to perform it. Maybe that's a better word than faking it. You have to perform it before it it's performed by the, the authorities who are also performing it. So there's a there's a pre-performance and there's sort of a a sort of uh, another performance that takes place that you have to do in order to 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 have some impact on I think on those sort of dynamics. Yeah, I see. Thank you. 
uh, Rasa is asking, uh, what concerns uh, emotions and even uh, place? Uh, everything is changing, as you mentioned, this ambient. Uh, how to deal with this, to deal with it? Um, everything's changing. Um, do you mean the maps in particular? Rasa, are you studying the many Gmail to Sarkashka? I mean situation and the maps, both, are changing uh, permanently. So for which time is useful, for five years, ten years, or <laughs> how do you think? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a great question. I don't, in some ways, I don't have an answer for it. Um, but I think it's, these things become historical documents. Um, and they become historical documents for a, a life that was never validated for practices that were never validated in the first time. So they become they become validated almost by, by becoming historical, right? Um, just to give an example, so the, the project I did in Stockport where um, we end up having some problems with um, the, the council and the developer who as part of their art practice decided to fund this, but um, they did not like the things we had um, put on the map so despite the fact that we had full creative freedom to do this, the funders were not prepared to be associated with us. So they withdrew their support from the whole thing. We removed their logo and they refused to distribute it in the local town because we talked about some of the social problems of the local area. We were not glorifying some of the sort of development that was taking place there. And the people who were the only people, local organization who were really keen to support this were um, mental health charities, basically. Mental health charities were the ones that really wanted to promote the map and they actually took a lot of the maps for us and were distributing the local area for working with the problems that they were encountering. And even recently, they're, they're still kind of um, keen on the project and promoting it in a sense. So there's a, there's a sort of history, um, I would argue in, in a place like that, I think some of the problems have not disappeared and I think it's the same the same problems are still there even after you know more than 10 years have passed you know a lot of these um a lot of the dynamics if you read through these maps have not changed even though you have these momentary you know you have everything from people responding to seeing having a spike of looking at an attractive person that they see but they also identify the sort of social dynamics that are much longer term that are really embedded in place so I think there's a history that, that remains of these, of these momentary encounters that actually are strategically embedded in, in place. So I do think they have, a, um, they have a sort of historical value in a sense of, of seeing what things were like then, but I think they also have a, a sense of, em, of embedded practices that might have remained. And you know, they raise a question of, you know, do we still see these patterns nowadays? So in some ways, it's a challenge for us to think about, you know, do these momentary things that we see on these maps, do they still have validity now? And if they do, that's quite a quite an interesting question to us, right? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Christian, it's uh, interesting for me. I, I guess uh, uh, for quite a lot of uh, our participants, uh, what uh, or how you see the role of architects in uh, uh, this uh, field, like, can they make any use out of your method or cooperate? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting, difficult <laughs> question. I mean, there's, in my experience, there's lots of different sorts of architects, right? I mean, I, I have lots of, um, I have friends who are building big housing complexes and I have friends who are doing sort of projects which are very similar to what I'm doing. So I, I think there's a, in my experience, the architecture is a very broad, it's a very broad area. You know, I used to teach at the, at the Bartlett um, in London and I, I was there for about seven years teaching architecture students, um, physically computing in many ways. So I, I don't claim to know exactly where, where the sort of architectural discussion is these days, but I do think there's a, um, at the very least, there's a, there's a shared focus on a, or on an interest in sort of the urban experience and how how we might be shaping, you know, what's our responsibility and what's our what's our agency in, in, in changing things in this area. And I, 
I, I have not yet found the right way of, of doing something more direct collaboration, you know. Um, I, I, like I said, I used to have these emails all the time where people wanted to me to use my method to do X, Y, Z. You know, I had everything from marketing companies wanting to identify where they should put the shopping complex. Um, you know, it, yeah, th there's very instrumental uses you can make of this stuff, but I think there's also very sensitive uses you can make. And I think people need to find their own way of translating it into, into something that's meaningful for them. You know, the same way as I tried to answer with the question about the sensors, I think there's a there's an openness to this method that I think allows you to take into different areas. And I guess I'm, I feel my responsibility is to be a bit clearer about what the method is. And I think I haven't had enough time to, or yeah, it, to some extent me becoming an academic is, a, is an opportunity to try and be more explicit about the methods I'm trying to use. So I hope by, by writing them down a little bit more, I can be a little bit more helpful in terms of suggesting and how, what, what it is specifically about the method that could be applied more, more horizontally to other areas, you know, for architects directly. Good. Um, I guess we're coming to the end. Uh, I am inviting you for the last question. Anyone? Yeah. Everyone is silent. <laughs> You're uh, maybe thinking, uh, uh, projecting their ideas. Well, maybe for me just to say that I really appreciated uh, this opportunity to talk to you and for the questions, which I thought were really great. And I really enjoyed it. So I, uh, thanks very much. And uh, you're welcome to, to get in touch with me if you do have more, more questions around this. Um, you can email me on christine at softhook.com if you want. Oh. But yeah, if there's, if there's any other where you want to go with this, you know, please, please get in touch or let me know. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christian, for sharing your knowledge with us. And I hope we will meet in Vilnius in the near future, someday maybe, John, for joint project. Thank and, you. Uh, I'm switching to Lucania just for announcement of the next lecture. Uh, Grishtu su priminimu, kad jau birželio 15 dieną mūsų laukė kita paskaita, kraštovaidžio architektė, Goda Harecijenės, skaitys paskaita, architektūrinė aplinka ir emocinės atsakas. Aiškus, traukdama ir biofilija, tokius dalykus jautrius žmogus egzistencijai, kaip birželio 15, o 30 dieną Karolina Ješinskaitė skaitys apie architektūros ir individuo erdvinį percepciją, skamba labai moksliškai, bet iš tiesų patiks labai daug tokių praktinių išvalgų ir panaudojimai pati yra VDA dėstytoja, meno doktorantė, tai iš tikrųjų turi sklo pasidalinti jau ir iš praktinės pusės. Tai kviečiau sekti mūsų naujienas ir registruoti.